Welcome back. Let's start by reviewing the governing equations for nonlinear finite elastic deformations in biomechanics. So in kinematics we have the strain displacement relation which is that the Lagrangian strain E is one half of F transpose F minus I where the deformation gradient tensor F has components FIR equals del XI del XR or in direct tensor notation, F is the grad of X, where the capital G indicates that these are partial derivatives with respect to the undeformed coordinates, capital X. Then we have the constitutive law and the hyperelastic relation for the Lagrangian second Piola Kirchhoff stress in terms of the strain energy function W is PRS equals one half del W del ERS plus del W del ESR, or we could just write PRS equals del W del ERS for short. Expressing the Cauchy stress in terms of this, the Cauchy stress tensor T is 1 over the determinant of F times FP F transpose. So this is the transformation that converts Lagrangian to Eulerian stress definition. Then we have the conservation of momentum. The force balance or conservation of linear momentum says that the divergence of the stress tensor plus the body forces is equal to zero. In the Lagrangian form, the stress tensor we use is the nominal stress tensor, which is P, the second piola kirchhoff stress tensor, times the transpose of the deformation gradient tensor. And the capital D here refers to the fact that the partial derivatives are with respect to the undeformed coordinates, capital X. Similarly, the body force vector here will have components referred to the undeformed state of the body. And then the moment balance is simply P equals P transpose, namely the Lagrangian stress tensor, like the Cauchy stress tensor, is symmetric uh, when conservation of angular momentum is imposed. And then finally we have conservation of mass in the Lagrangian form where rho is the mass density says that rho equals rho naught times det f where rho naught is the density of the undeformed body and rho is the density of the deformed body and the determinant of f is the ratio of the deformed volume to the undeformed volume. So we've seen that there are some analytic solutions that can be obtained with these equations but only for fairly simple uh, problems such as the axisymmetric inflation stretch and twist of a cylinder or the biaxial stretch of a uh, homogeneous slab. To solve these equations for more realistic geometries and boundary conditions we need to use numerical methods. Now applying these equations to problems in biomechanics we really have a multi-scale problem. For example in the mechanics of the heart we need to integrate the contraction at the level of the molecular motors, the cross bridges in cardiac muscle, into the mechanics of the 3D myocardial tissue, uh, and then solve the equilibrium equations on the geometry of the ventricles and atria, but subject to boundary conditions that are actually being generated by the circulation in response to the contraction of the heart. So we actually have the constitutive model here, we have our equilibrium equations here, but we in general also need a model of the circulation that generates the boundary conditions, and we need models of the biophysics of the muscle contraction processes. So this clearly requires numerical methods, but we have numerical methods that can account for the myofilament interactions, uh, the elasticity of the tissue, uh, the mechanics of the ventricles, and uh, the boundary conditions of the gener generated by the circulation. And the key method that we use for solving these problems is called the finite element method, which is the most versatile and uh, powerful numerical method for solving uh, the widest class of partial differential equations that we encounter in bioengineering. So the finite element method first evolved from the matrix methods of structural analysis developed by engineers in the early 1960s. It uses the algorithms of linear algebra and was only later found to have a more fundamental mathematical foundation that had previously been uh, discovered by mathematicians. The essential features of the finite element method are not so much in how the problem is solved, but how it's formulated. 
And there are two main formulations that are mostly equivalent that are normally used in finite element methods. There are variational formulations, uh, such as the rayleigh ritz method, and there are weighted residual formulations, such as the Galerkin's method. And we'll be using the latter, the Galerkin finite element method. Both approaches lead to integral equations, which we call the weak form, instead of differential equations, which we would call the strong form. So recall that when we derive the partial differential equations for continuum mechanics, we started with integral equations. And in a way, what these methods do, the variational methods and the weighted residual methods do, is allow us to take these differential equations and turn them back into integral equations. And the advantage of this is that when we discretize these integral equations, integrals give us sums which are easily to handle, whereas derivatives give us differences which are not as easily generalized. But that is in fact what we do when we use a finite difference method to solve partial differential equations. We discretize uh, dif derivatives using differences. In the finite element method, we discretize integrals as sums. And as we'll see, the benefit of this is it makes the assembly of the finite element problem uh, more flexible and powerful. So the first step in the finite element method is that the domain, the region of interest, is discretized into a mesh. And the mesh consists of a finite number of subdomains or elements, and each element approximates the solution using a sum of normally polynomial interpolation functions, which we'll call psi. So these will interpolate variables, including the solutions, across the domains of our elements. We are able to ensure continuity between the elements by defining the polynomial coefficients at the vertices or nodes of the elements. So here, for example, we have a, an example of a finite element mesh with four elements and nine nodes. And you can see each element has four local nodes. So element four, for example, has four nodes that correspond to the global nodes, eight, nine, five, and six. The finite element equations are derived, as we mentioned, from the integral or weak form of the governing equations. So in contrast to finite differences, which is obtained from the strong or derivative form of the governing equations, where L here would represent some linear differential operator, the finite element formulation would the equivalent finite element formulation would be the integral of L u minus f, which we'd call the residual, and would be zero if we had the exact solution, multiplied by our interpolation functions psi is equal to zero. So you can see that the finite element method doesn't enforce the solution to be exactly correct, but the correct solution uh, is admitted by the finite element solution. And so the key is to do a formulation of this integral uh, numerical method that results in solutions that converge. In other words, as we make our elements small enough and we have enough of them, we get closer and closer to the solution to the strong form of the differential equations. So the weighted residual formulation in applied to the equilibrium equations results in what's known as the virtual work equations, equations that were already known in mechanics. So we formulate the weighted residual or weak form of the governing equations by taking our differential equation, putting all the terms on one side, so the right-hand side is zero, so this is the residual, multiplying it by some weighting function w, and then integrating over the domain. So in the case of our governing equations, we would have divergence of s, the nominal stress, plus rho times b, the body forces, multiplied by a weighting function w and integrated over the volume is equal to zero. Now we can apply the divergence or green gas theorem, the same theorem we use to derive the uh, equilibrium equations from the uh, integral statement that we started with for the force balances. And that then allows us to transfer this derivative from s to w. So we get integrating by parts, we get minus s dot grad w integrated over the volume plus rho b times w integrated over the volume plus n dot s. So this is the boundary term that comes out of the divergence theorem. And 
n here is the unit normal to the domain, but in this case measured with respect to coordinates in the undeformed state, hence the capital N, because this is the Lagrangian stress S. And this uh, integral is over the surface A. And so we, we get a statement here in which the derivative of the stress has been replaced by a derivative on our arbitrary function w, and so uh, a side effect of this formulation is we no longer actually have to evaluate derivatives of the stress in order to solve this form of the equations, and that turns out to be a major advantage of the finite element method. And so this can then be rearranged since n dot s from Cauchy's formula gives us the traction vector t, but again these are the tractions referred to uh, surfaces defined in the undeformed state of the body, and hence the capital N here. So we have S dot grad W integrated over the volume equals the integral over the volume of rho B times W plus the integral over the surface of the tractions T times W. Now, if we replace W with virtual displacements delta U, and we substitute for S in terms of the Piola-Kirchhoff stress as PF transpose, the equations that we get are called the virtual work equations, and they look like this. So they says that the work done by the stresses in performing a virtual displacement delta U is balanced by the work done by the body forces in performing those displacements delta u plus the work done by the surface tractions. So this is an equation from mechanics that predated the finite element method and it turns out that the finite element formulation for uh, the equilibrium equations of mechanics uh, as derived using this weighted residual approach is equivalent to solving these well-known virtual work equations which essentially consider the work done in performing virtual displacements delta u uh, due to the stresses, the body forces, and the surface tractions. Where here P, the second Piola-Kirchhoff stress, comes from our hyperelastic strain energy formulation, so del W del E. T, the Cauchy stress, is related to the Lagrangian stress by the equation we've seen before. E, the Lagrangian strain is related to the deformation gradient tensor, as we've seen, and the components of the deformation gradient tensor are del x i del big x j. So now we can integrate these governing equations for each element, assemble a global system of equations by adding contributions from each element as follows. So we tend to standardize our elements by having a localized set of coordinates that typically vary from 0 to 1 in each area. So you can think of a set of local coordinates as a sort of a unit square corresponding to every element. And then we can use this formulation to derive the governing equation as a, if the governing equations are linear, as a linear system of equations with as many uh, equations as we have unknowns. So in a simple linear problem with one degree of freedom per node, we would have four linear equations and the four unknowns, u1, u2, u3, and u4, being the unknowns at each element node, and f1, f2, f3, and f4 are the forces or right-hand side terms that come from our governing formulation. And so the real key to the finite element method is if we can derive this a discrete set of equations, one for each degree of freedom of our element, how do we put them back in to describe the combined behavior of the entire mesh? And the answer is simply by addition. Because we're using an integral formulation, the integral over the entire domain is just the sum of the integral over each individual element. So if we can derive these element equations from an integral equation, then assembling them back into the whole system is a simple matter of addition. And so now it's just a matter of adding the components of this 4x4 system of equations into the right spot in a global 9x9 system of equations. So for example, element 4 here has element nodes 
1, 2, 3, 4 corresponding to global nodes 8, 9, 5, and 6. So that means that uh, row 1 and column 1 of element 4's equations would go in row 8 and column 8 of the global system of equations. Similarly, wherever there's a 2 here, that would go in row and column 9. And wherever there's a 3 and a 4, those would go in rows and columns 5 and 6. So we end up putting these 16 numbers here in the rows 5, 6, 8, and 9, columns 5, 6, 8, and 9 of the global stiffness matrix. And then we end up adding the known forces or uh, right-hand side terms, positions 1, 2, 3, and 4, into positions 8, 9, 5, and 6. So what happens when we these positions are already occupied when we go to another element? So for example, element 2 here shares uh, global nodes 5 and 6. Well, all we do is add because uh, the integral over the entire domain is the sum of the integral over each element. So wherever the terms combine, they combine additively. And this is the major power of using an integral formulation. Integration corresponds to addition, and addition gives us a natural way of assembling the system of uh, global equations from the system of element equations that we uh, derive uh, for each finite element. So the next question is, how do we perform this interpolation. So polynomials are particularly convenient because they're readily differentiated and integrated. However, if we increase the polynomial order too much to allow for more com complex variations, they tend to oscillate and behave unphysically and unrealistically. So instead what we do is we divide the domain into elements and use lower order piecewise polynomials over each element. Most of the time these are linear, they don't have to be. Uh, for example, let's say we were expecting our solution of our real-life problem to look something like this, where this is u as a function of x. Uh, we could try and use a higher-order polynomial over this entire domain to try and approximate this solution. However, it would be easier to divide the domain into three subdomains, into three elements, and allow a linear variation uh, between, uh, across each interval. However, you can see this does create a problem because there are the potential for a discontinuity in our solutions at the intervals, at the boundaries between the intervals. So rather than separately constrain these two functions to have the same value at the boundary, we can do that by reformulating the linear equations in each element in terms of the values at the ends. And we call these end or end points or vertex points the nodes of each element. So, for example, if we wrote that u of x is x2 minus x over x2 minus x1 times u1 plus x minus x1 times x2 minus x1 times u2, then this formulation will naturally lead to a linear variation between u1 at x equals x1 and u2 at x equals x2, and we could reformulate that by normalizing, noticing that x2 minus x1 is the length of the element h in the x direction, and so this would be x2 over h minus x over h times u1 plus x over h minus x1 over h times u2. And if we then define x over h, this normalized coordinate in this interval between x1 and x2, to be xc, a number that varies from 0 to 1, then we would be able to write 1 minus xe times u1 plus xe times u2. So again, if xe is 0 at x1, at the left-hand end of the element, then that means that u would equal u1, because this would be 0 times u2, and 1 minus 0 is 1. And at the other end, uh, where xe was 1, u would equal u2. And since these functions are linear, then we have a linear variation uh, from one end to the other. And since this function is normalized, we could actually use the same function in every element. However, we really want u as a function of x, not u as a function of xe. So how do we handle that? Well, a clever technique is to interpolate 
u as a function of xe and x as a function of xe, and this is called an isoparametric formulation. So if we define again a local coordinate varying from 0 to 1 in each element, and the parameters of the linear variation in each element being the values at the ends, then we can have a linear interpolation of u as a function of xe within each element, and a linear interpolation of x as a function of xe within each element. And so if we, this is a parametric formulation where for a given value of xe, we'll have x and u. And these functions, 1 minus xe and xe, are called the one-dimensional linear Lagrange interpolation functions. And you can see we're using the same linear Lagrange interpolation function for u and for x. So these are what these linear Lagrange interpolation functions look like. You can see that uh, it's, you can see that c1 is 1 minus xc, and so it's a linear function that varies from 1 at x equals 0 to 0 at x equals 1. And you can see that c2, the second linear Lagrange basis function, is the opposite. It's a linear function that's 0 at x equals 0 and 1 at x equals 1. So we can now use these linear Lagrange interpolation functions in each element. And since the elements share these global nodes at their vertices, uh, u2 of element 1 becomes u1 of element 2, and u2 uh, two of element 2 becomes u1 of element 3. And in this way, with four parameters, u1, u2, u3, and u4, we can define three connected piecewise uh, linear uh, functions that are continuous at their boundaries. So now let's do a little example uh, to illustrate how this integral approach works in the finite element method. Imagine our governing equation was just a simple differential equation d2u dx squared equals 2 subject to boundary conditions uh, at x equals 1 that u is 0 and at x equals 4 that u equals 9. So it's not very difficult to confirm that the solution to this uh, differential equation is that u of x is x minus 1 all squared. So if d2u dx squared is constant, then u must be a quadratic. And you can see that um, when x is equal to 1, u is 0. And when x is equal to 4, 4 minus 1 is 3 squared equals 9. So this solution satisfies this differential equation. Let's see if we can solve it using the finite element method. So in other words, we have a domain where x varies from 1 to 4, and we know that u is 0 at one end and 9 at the other end, and we're trying to find intermediate values, uh, and we'll approximate this domain with three elements, each uh, unit length long, so that it will amount to finding what the values of the nodes of our finite element interpolation are at x equals 2 and x equals 3. So first we have to formulate the weighted residual Galerkin form of the governing equation, which remember is the residual, uh, the differential operator minus the right hand side, uh, multiplied by a weighting function which we choose to be those interpolation functions psi. So in other words we get the integral from x equals 1 to x equals 4 of d2u dx squared times psi minus 2 times psi. So this is a differential equation is d2u dx squared minus 2. It's multiplying each term times by our basis function, interpolation function, multiplying each term by our interpolation function psi gives us this integral equation. And since we have two interpolation functions, it's actually two equations for each element. Now we're going to do our integration by parts, and so, so d2u dx squared times psi integrated will become minus du dx times d psi dx plus uh, du dx times psi evaluated between 1 and 4. So this is just an integration by parts. So our green gas theorem just reduces to an integration by parts. And then we haven't changed this term, minus 2 times psi integrated with respect to x. So expanding this out, we get the integral between 1 and 4 of minus du dx d psi dx 
is equal to the integral between 1 and 4 of 2 psi dx minus du dx times psi evaluated at the end. So we've written it this way because u is still unknown, and this is going to be expressed in terms of the coefficients of the approximating polynomials. Our interpolation function is known, and we're assuming that our boundary, these are boundary terms, that our boundary conditions are known. So these are known, this contains the unknowns. Further though, um, we have no uh, derivative boundary conditions at the end, and so we can simply leave these out. These are called the natural boundary conditions. So next we discretize the problem, and in this problem we're going to discretize the domain uh, into four global nodes, u1, u2, u3, and u4, at x equals 1, 2, 3, and 4, uh, and three linear elements, each with two uh, element nodes. So element 1 here, with element nodes 1 and 2, corresponding to global nodes 1 and 2. Element 2 here, with element nodes 1 and 2, corresponding to global nodes 2 and 3. And element 3 here, with element nodes 1 and 2, corresponding to global nodes 3 and 4. So notice that the adjacent elements share global nodes, so the global variable u2 here is element node 2 of element 1 and element node 1 of element 2. Now we'll use two linear Lagrange interpolation functions for each element, psi1 and psi2, such that u of x in each element equals u times psi1 plus u times psi2, or the sum of ui psi i for i equals 1 to 2. And here again are those interpolation functions and writing our local coordinates xe in terms of x for each element. Uh, you can see that uh, xe is just x minus 1 for the first element, x minus 2 for the second element, and x minus 3 for the third element in this really simple example. And each of our interpolation functions is just 0 to 1, and 1 to 0 linear variations. Those are the two linear Lagrange interpolation functions. So now we can derive the finite element equations by applying this approximation and we can assemble our integral over the entire domain by breaking up into integrals over each of the elements. So this is the contribution of element 1 integrating from x equals 1 to 2. This is the contribution of element 2 integrating from x equals 2 to x equals 3. And this is the contribution of element 3 integrating from x equals 3 to x equals 4, these terms that we previously derived. And then on the right hand side we have the integral from 1 to 2 uh, of 2c, so this is the contribution uh, from the right hand side to the right hand side vector from element 1. This is the contribution to the right hand side from element 2, and this is the contribution to the right hand side from element 3. Now remember that u in each element is u1 c1 and plus u2 c2, where we've previously shown what these interpolation functions c1 and c2 are. So now considering element 1, minus du dx will be minus u1 d psi1 dx minus u2 d psi2 dx from this. And then d psi dx will be d psi i dx because we have two of these, so this is actually two equations. And then our right-hand side term will be the integral from 1 to 2 of 2 times psi i. Again, we have two of these, so this is actually two equations. So this is one element, and this one element has two equations, uh, one for psi equals 1. So these are our two element equations for element 1, uh, one for when i equals 1 and one for when i equals 2. And in terms of the two unknowns, u1 and u2 being the nodal unknowns at the uh, each end of the element, where our interpolation functions, psi, are our linear Lagrange basis functions that we already know. So in fact, these derivatives are just the constants. They're either plus or minus 1. So in other words, we have a 2 by 2 system of linear equations that you could write as kij uj equals fi, where this integral of 2 times psi i would be our two right-hand side terms. Okay. And 
K here, Kij here, are the components of what's known as the element stiffness matrix. And Fi are the components of the element load vector. So now let's compute those element stiffness matrices. So for each element, we have equations, two by two equations of the form K times U equals F, where K is a two by two stiffness matrix. U is a vector of unknown uh, nodal parameters, U1 and U2. And uh, F is the right-hand side vector, um, that is so-called load vector. So the element stiffness matrix and load vector would therefore be computed from del psi i del x del psi j del x. And this is kij. These are the components of the stiffness matrix. And you notice we can swap i and j here. And therefore, the stiffness matrix in this problem and most of the problems we encounter are symmetric. And the load vector has components, which are the integral of 2 times psi i. So this is just taking out the summation of u1 and u2 here, and being left with what the coefficients that multiply u1 and u2 are. So for element 1, for example, the local coordinate xc is just x minus 1. So our linear Lagrange interpolation functions 1 minus xc and xc are just 2 minus x and x minus 1. And the derivatives uh, del psi del x are just the same as del psi del xi because delta x and delta xi in each element are both 1. So, so therefore, evaluating this element stiffness matrix, you can see that d psi dx is just d psi dxi, which is just plus or minus 1. So d psi 1 dxi is minus 1. And multiplying that times d psi 1 dxi would be minus 1 times minus 1 is plus 1. But we have a minus sign here, so this is a minus 1. Then taking the 1, 2 component, we have a minus times a minus 1 times a plus 1 gives us plus 1. The 2, 1 is similarly a plus 1. And then the 2, 2 is um, 1 times 1 times a minus 1 here. So we get minus 1, 1, 1 minus 1 integrated between 1 and 2. So the integral of minus 1 is minus x. The integral of 1 is x. So this the element stiffness matrix for element 1 is just minus x, x, x minus x evaluated between 1 and 2 which would therefore be minus 2 minus minus 1 is minus 1, 2 minus 1 is 1, 2 minus 1 is 1, and minus 2 minus minus 1 is minus 1. So in other words, our element stiffness matrix is just minus 1, 1, 1, minus 1. So for as complicated as it looks, we really get a very simple stiffness matrix. And now we can do the same for the right-hand side. This time we're integrating two times our interpolation functions. So our interpolation functions again are 2 minus x and x minus 1. So the integral of 2 times 2 minus x is just the integral of 4 minus 2x. And the integral of 2 times x minus 1 is the integral of 2x minus 2. So the integral of 4 minus 2x is 4x minus x squared. The integral of 2x minus 2 is x squared minus 2x. Again, we evaluate that between 1 and 2. And we get 4 times 2 is 8, minus 2 times 2 is 4, minus 4 times 1 is 4, minus 1 times 1 is 1, gives us 4 minus 3 is equal to 1. And then for this term, we get 4 minus 4, which is 0, minus 1 minus 2, um, which gives, which is minus 1, so therefore we get 1. So we've now computed the element stiffness matrix and the element load vector for element 1. And it turns out in this problem, because every element has the same length and the governing equations are the same for every element, in fact, uh, it's easy to see that the uh, stiffness matrix and the right-hand side vector for the other two elements is actually exactly the same. So in other words, all three element stiffness matrices, 
are the same as that for element 1. All three right-hand side vectors are the same as that what we just computed for element 1. So now the next step is to assemble these three elements back into one global system. So now we have three 2x2 two two stiffness matrices and three 2x1 uh, column matrices. But what we really want to assemble is a 4x4 four four global system. And so, as we mentioned earlier, we simply add them in the right place. So this is a 4x4 four four matrix where each row and column corresponds to uh, global nodes 1 to 4. And we just have to put the element stiffness matrix in the right location. So the right location for element 1 is the 1, 2 location. So our minus 1, 1, 1, minus 1 go in the 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1, and 2, 2 positions. For element 2, uh, the element nodes of element 2 are nodes 2 and 3. So we have to put the stiffness matrix for element 2, which is the same as that for element 1, into the two, three uh, rows and columns of our 4x4 four four system. So we get minus 1, 1, 1, minus 1 in the second and third rows and columns. And then finally, element 3 is corresponds to global nodes 3 and 4, so the four entries of our element stiffness matrix go in the 3, 3, uh, 3, 4, 4, 3, and 4, 4 positions of the global stiffness matrix. And again, because we're integrating, the integral over the entire domain is just the sum of the integral over the subdomains, and so where these terms overlap, they simply add, and so we end up with minus 1, 1, 1, minus 2, 1, 1, minus 2, 1, 1, minus 1. And notice the matrix is symmetric because the governing equations were symmetric and the uh, element stiffness matrices were symmetric. And notice the matrix is also sparse. It's, and it's sparse because there's nothing here, say, in the 1, 4 position uh, or the 4, 1 position because uh, element 3 doesn't interact with uh, element 1. And so node 4 has no connection with node 1. Um, and similarly, we can compute the global right-hand side vector by adding up the individual element load vectors, which would be 1, 1 in the first two positions for element 1, 1, 1 in the second and third positions for element 2, and 1, 1 in the third and fourth positions for element 3. So we get 1, 2, 2, 1. So we now have our global stiffness matrix and our global right-hand side representing the uh, equations for our system, uh, which has four unknowns. However, before we can actually solve this system of equations, we need to apply some boundary conditions. So this is the system of equations, our global system of equations. But if you tried to solve it, you'd find you couldn't get a solution because you need to some, have some sort of uh, constant of integration, some sort of boundary condition to emit a specific solution. And if you recall, our boundary conditions were that u at x equals 1 was 0 and u at x equals 4 was 9. In other words, u1 is 0 and u4 is 9. So we actually already know u1 and u4. So somehow we have to enforce this constraint on the system before we can solve it. So it actually just leaves us with two equations left to solve, equations for u2 and u3. So if we write out the equations for u2 and u3, taking into account that we know what u1 is, then we would get that 1 times u1, which is 0, minus 2 times u2, plus 1 times u3, plus 0 times u4, which is 9, is equal to 2. So the taking into account the fact that we know u1 and u4, uh, equation 2 becomes 2u2 plus u3 is equal to 2. And similarly, taking into account that we know u1 and u4, for uh, the third equation, we again have 0 times u1 is 0, plus 1 times u2, minus 2 times u3, plus 1 times u4. Now u4 is 9, so we get plus 9 here, is equal to 2. So we can now take this 9 and subtract it from the right hand side to get u2 minus 2u3 is equal to minus 7. So if we now solve these two equations, 
we'll see that you get that u2 is equal to 1 and u3 is equal to 4. So if we check that, minus 2 times 1 is minus 2, plus 4 is equal to 2. And u1 is 1, minus 2 times 4 is minus 7, plus 9 is equal to 2. So these are the correct solutions, u1 equals 1 and u3 equals 4, which turns out to be exactly the right solutions for our original quadratic equation. So that little example just helps perhaps to show how the uh, integral formulation can actually give you uh, a solution to a differential equation. And in fact, in this case, it actually gives us the exact solution at the nodes. It's not giving us the exact solution everywhere because we've assumed a linear variation of uh, u between our elements. But obviously, if you made more and more elements, then this piecewise linear approximation would get closer and closer to the true quadratic solution. Another important feature of this solution is that we were solving a second-order differential equation, yet we didn't need approximating solutions uh, that even had second derivatives. Our approximating solutions were linear. Um, and by using an integral formulation, we effectively lowered the order of the equation we were solving so that a linear approximation was sufficient to solve a solution where, in fact, the derivatives of linear functions would have been zero. So, now, this is an important property of the integral formulation as well, namely that it lowers the order of the equation that you're solving and allows you to use uh, linear approximations for your uh, unknowns, even in a second-order uh, governing system of equations.